All right, welcome everybody. Uh, James Pittman, co-founder here at DocketWise. I have as my guest today, Roman Zelichenko. And our topic today is immigration law, uh, the metaverse and web 3.0. And uh, we're gonna be coming at this from a couple of different angles. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what is meant by some of these terms that we hear every day now, metaverse, web 3.0, virtual reality, uh, what are we? What are they? What what are those things? What are they talking about? And um, you know, what are the possible implications of that for immigration law practitioners, um, both you know in the in the present, in terms of uh, you know what types of cases uh, you know, might you have that right now uh, impact metaverse technology, and then you know prospectively, just sort of some ideas about how the metaverse could affect the the practice of immigration law and affect our lives. Uh, as people in the immigration industry. Um, and I want to encourage all of you um, to, you know, give mm -hmm. us any comments or ideas that you have in the chat. I mean, we're going to be talking about some things, particularly in the second part of the webinar that are very theoretical. Um, and if you, if these uh, give you ideas and you want to comment or toss out an idea for discussion, please, please do that in the chat. We, we want you to do that. We welcome it. Um, and, but first let me introduce Roman and, uh, Roman Zelichenko, but Roman, introduce yourself, um, please. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks so much, James, and you know, to the DocuWise team for putting this on. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here for this definitely interesting and different discussion within the immigration space. Hopefully, there will be more discussions around the metaverse and Web3 within immigration. Um, so hope, you know, this is just be the beginning, hopefully. Um, so for if you don't know me, my name is Roman Zelichenko. I used to be an immigration attorney, worked in business immigration and focused on uh, basically high volume H1Bs and, and now um, am in the technology side and launched a company called Laborless, which um, is specifically focused on automating H-1B visa compliance. So something I used to do as an attorney and part of that H-1B process, you know, we've now automated. Um, I, generally, you know, like James said, I mean, I don't know that I would consider myself either an expert on Web3 or, or the metaverse. That being said, as a person who's really interested in technology, and I suspect James, you are too, and your team at DocketWise, you know, we're always constantly reading up on what's coming, what's new. Um, Realistically, as much as I love the immigration industry uh, and I'm part of it and am an immigrant myself, you know, the immigration industry is not typically the one that's leading the way in terms of technological change. And that's okay. I mean, we work in an industry that really relies on tried and true technology. We can't be screwing around with things when people's livelihoods are, are on the line. That being said, though, there are a lot of industries trying new things. I mean, Bitcoin and, you know, just general blockchain technology and VR and AR headsets, you know, those might not be relevant for immigration today. They are being tried in other industries. But the idea behind this webinar is to explore ways that some of these sort of futuristic and burgeoning technologies may be potentially relevant to the immigration space um, in the future. And of course, what bridges can we build uh, between them today? So. Um, and again, like James said, please do share any comments and thoughts. This isn't really, I don't think, going to be the kind of webinar where, you know, you might have kind of expert questions for us to answer. Maybe we'll try, but really more about having all of you here as um, fellow kind of participants of the discussion. We're going to be sh sharing some ideas that we have researched, um, but of course, the the concept is let us know what you think. If you've been reading something about Web 3.0 or, or um uh, the metaverse and you have had some ideas of how it might impact immigration just put them out in the comments and we'd love to kind of just discuss them uh, sort of with you here so i guess I'll, I'll start off by maybe giving a little bit of information or sort of historic background of the internet i mean this sounds weird but it, you know it is it is part of um understanding where the internet came from is part of understanding where it's going so i'm a millennial i'm 35 years old I'm kind of an older millennial. So I was a young, you know, I was, I don't remember how old I was, eight or nine or 10 years old when we first got a computer in my apartment. Um, and we had AOL, we had, you know, America Online. You remember you get the CDs in your house, in in, in, your, in the mail, you know, it gives you like, you, you get games, you get um, access to the internet. I mean, it is, it's crazy to think that that was only, you know, 20, just over 20 years ago and how completely different the world is today. So when you talk about Web 3.0, does that mean that there's a web 2.0 and a web 1.0? I mean, generally the answer to that is yes. Um, so web 1.0, which is kind of the original internet, if you will, that was mass populated, um, or, or I should say popular for the masses, 
it was sort of like, if any of you remember, it was like the internet back in the late 90s, um, where you just would go onto a browser and you would type in a, a, a web URL and you would effectively get very, very simple web pages. They have mostly text. At some point, we had images that were added to it. I remember, if you if you remember going to some websites or on the bottom, they said kind of there was a counter that showed you how many people had visited that page either that day or for the lifetime of it. Um, so that was the web. It was simply basically web. It was text only information that was available to people who had an internet connection. Um, so super simple and not a lot of people were using it. Web 2.0 is really kind of where we live today. And Web 2.0 is when the internet, as we know it, the websites that we typically interact with went from being just text only to effectively being something that you can sort of interact with. There were videos, there were things to click on, you can drop down menus. I mean, there's a whole layer of kind of coding and web development that was that was created and built on top of the foundation of web 1.0 that allowed you to interact with the website. I mean, when you think about it, if you're going onto airbnb.com today, right, that's a website. I mean, it's still a website. Yes, it's beautiful. And there are, you're, you can toggle between apartments or houses, you can filter, you can look at a map and things like that. Um, those are all technologies that are built on the web. And so that is what we look at today as sort of web 2.0. Um, a lot, there's a lot of big companies that dominate web 2.0. Social media companies dominate web 2.0, right? If you go online, I don't know if any of you ever talked to somebody who's saying they read something on the news. Well, typically what they've read is somebody's you know feed or a post on social media. That's what a lot of people kind of start to associate with the internet. They associate websites like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter on their on their you know computers um, as the internet. And 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 that is for uh, many cases. Um, the tr the truth, sort of. Obviously, there's yeah. Go ahead, Jen. Oh no, I was going to say that. Yeah, I mean, and and that's part of you know part of the the transition as we're going to talk about from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0 is that the predominance of uh, several large players, Google, Facebook, now Meta, YouTube, etc., et cetera, Twitter. You know that that predominance uh, and some of the criticisms of it is what sort of is also sparring some of the uh, aspects of Web 3.0. We were want to decentralize now. Whether we're going to wind up with decentralization or not is is anybody's guess. Um, you know, uh, but that's that's um, you know sort of one of the impetus uh, for Web 3.0. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of discussion now around data privacy. Um, you know, and and sort of who owns my data. Right. I, yes, I go online, but who's tracking? Is anybody tracking what I'm doing, what I'm clicking on, what I'm reading, et cetera? Um, and then sort of what are they doing with that information? And, and you come to realize that there are companies, there are just a handful of companies that sort of own this data and they sell it and they typically anonymize it. So at the very least, it's not like your name and address and other personal information is being shared, but they know demographic data that they know that. You know, they know your sex, they know your they know your age or, or approximate, right? They know maybe where you live. They may triangulate data around how much money you probably make, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And then they sell that data to various companies that need that data for 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 things. And so I think web 3.0, at least one of the big things that I've been reading is, you know, the idea behind um the idea behind it is that it's going to be decentralized. The web browsing the web will not necessarily be like browsing. Facebook and having Facebook own the clicks and own all of the activity that you uh, are, are using on your, you know, the, the, all the activity that you're doing in order to use the web. Um, I think the idea of it is going to be, um, so again, not going to dive into the details of it in part because I'm not an expert on, you know, but the blockchain is something that is sort of underpins Web 3.0. And for those who um, are not aware, the blockchain effectively is this technology that allows multiple parties to sort of own the history of the internet, if you will. And so I can't go in and um, I can't go in and fabricate information. I can't go in and steal information, et cetera, because the information that lives on the internet is like living on multiple people's computers at the same time. And all of those computers sort of have to have the same historic data of what's happening on a particular website in order for that website, in order for that information to be, to exist on the web. Yeah, information. Right. Yeah. So the blockchain, yeah, a technology based on cryptography where 
uh, you have a record of transactions that have taken place and the, and the record exists on numerous computers and it's also a public ledger. So there can't be any, any falsification or alteration. Once a transaction has occurred, it's indelibly you know, recorded on a ledger that is public and lives in multiple places. Yeah, and, and you know, the idea too, we're talking a lot, and we're, again, we're not gonna get political here, um, and we're gonna move on from this sort of historic, I definitely write, encourage you all to go read. There's a lot of articles that break this stuff down probably much better than, certainly much better than I can do it. Um, but there's also this concept of, you know, censorship on the internet and, and what companies control what's seen, you know, what, the, that leads to disinformation or misinformation, et cetera. Um, the, the idea behind Web 3.0 is that sort of nobody controls the internet. Um, it is controlled by everybody. And so there's sort of a democratic aspect to it. Now, keep in mind, again, the, these are all sort of theoretical underpinnings of Web 3.0. How it will and already is manifesting, you know, isn't the sort of perfect world that is thought up, that was thought up by the theorists, you know, who, who were creating Web 3.0. These are just sort of the ideas behind it. Um, so I don't want you to go say like, well, then every, you know, in any case, let's not like, you know, we're not going to get into the far depths of what um, can be because it's easy to to fall down that trap. So I think the idea, the general idea behind Web 3.0 versus uh, Web 2.0, which is today is, again, the concept that it is going to be decentralized. There is not going to be the major players like Google and Facebook, et cetera, who own um, all of our data or a large majority of our data and who don't control what information is or is not disseminated to the masses. Yeah, um, so it's sort of dem democratizing the web. Absolutely. And Roman, let's just, so this term metaverse, but let's, is, yeah. are we going to use metaverse synonymous with web 3.0 or is metaverse an yeah. aspect of 3.0? I mean, I don't think there is one answer to this, but um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we're, we're, we're pretty much saying that the metaverse is a is 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 somewhat synonymous with web 3.0 it at, at least it represents web 3.0 plus the addition of virtual reality yeah exactly so for those so now to move on to the idea behind the metaverse really it's sort of a, a simple concept to, to to understand it's it's just sort of a virtual three three-dimensional virtual space or, or i guess just a livable virtual space that you may spend your time on and interact with other people and services and, and and things in that space. I mean, if you think about, if you think about back to, let's just go back to the web 1.0 days and just when web 2.0 was growing, how many businesses, including many immigration law firms did not have a website. And if you talk to folks from back then, or if you read accounts of people who were kind of holding off, a lot of them would say, we don't need a website. We have, well, we're in the yellow pages uh, or the white pages, like no yellow pages, right? The white pages is for people. The yellow pages are for businesses. So we need the, we're in the yellow pages. We have a beautiful storefront. We advertise on the radio. We have billboards. Why would we have, there's this internet's this weird thing. People aren't going to sit in front of a box in front of a screen for hours a day. Why would we, right? So that conversation was happening quite a bit, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and and what, what now, if a company does not have a website, does not have a web presence, you actually start to doubt the legitimacy of that business, right? It's 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 almost imperative to have that. And so, if you think about the internet, you know, this I'm looking at a screen right now, and I'm, I have a browser open, and that is a world, but that's a world that we kind of navigate by yes, clicking around, but it's mostly by typing a you know, a URL into the browser, it takes us to a particular location on the web, and I could use, you know, interact with the website. The idea behind the metaverse is also this interconnectivity, but it's going to be in a more, um, uh, more sort of realistic and navigable world. So think about a video game. I mean, if you think about being a character in a video game walking around, imagine the whole internet being a big video game. Imagine if I went to docketwise.com on the browser today as Web 2.0 in the metaverse, I'm going to walk my little avatar over to the Docketwise, you know, whatever you guys build. Right. Headquarters, yeah, your virtual headquarters in the sky because you're cloud-based. You know, I have to take my little rocket, you know, whatever. It, it, it's almost unfathomable how much opportunity there is but the the concept people have to agree on the concept that as much time as we spend on the internet now which is a, a place if you will we the the idea behind people who are you know pushing for the metaverse and building it like mark zuckerberg with meta is that in the future we're going to move away from what we see as the web today and we're going to move towards interacting not just in a video game context but interacting with businesses with each other on a personal level etc in this like web 3.0 based metaverse 
Yeah, so, so it's going to pull in. God, yeah. I was just going to add, it's going to pull in a number of senses. You're not just reading. You're not just watching or watching and listening. You're interacting, right? You're, in a sense, you're, you're you can even, you know, you're even virtually touching. You're, you're more sensual, mo uh, sensory modalities are coming in and the sense, your sense of reality is, is going to be much, much more heightened. I will say for folks, if you're, if you're, I mean, I see some attendees here, if you're listening, let us know what you think about this stuff. I mean, you can even say in the chat something like this is crazy, or you can, you know, maybe you've had some experiences. You know, one thing I'll share, for example, is I've run a virtual um, conference for the past couple of years on digital marketing, you know, for immigration, et cetera. And um, I've held, I've held it in a space called Gather. Um, and Gather is this sort of virtual reality kind of place where you can get a, an avatar and walk around. Um, in it. And and we were, you know, people who were there were interacting with, DocuWise had a booth there one of the years, and we were interacting with each other. And then we would walk into a, 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 a hall, if you will, and then a Zoom window would come up. And then there was, you know, the kind of panel discussions from the professionals. So, but the idea of having a little avatar and walking around with your keyboard as an immigration lawyer at an immigration law conference is sort of a simple way of looking at the metaverse. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the different types of position or, or the different types of visa opportunities today, like we're, let's get out of this futuristic kind of world and talk about today, you know, what immigration attorneys can look at in terms of visa types yeah. and work you can do with, with regards to the metaverse. Right. So let me take the first one. And that's going to be an O visa for NFT artists. So an NFT is a non-fungible token, and that's basically a unique digital object, right? It's a unique object with a traceable digital signature. And that uh, that digital signature is proof of its originality. So this has now been used to create artwork, basically things that are just as if uh, you would paint a painting, you can create an original piece of digital art. It can be, it's unique. It's, there's one of a kind. And there are actually artists now that are producing these and selling them sometimes for very, very high prices. You'd be shocked actually. Um, and so, well, one of the things that we can think about is, you know, just as with a, an artist working in conventional media, uh, we might you know, file for an O-1 visa for them. So that is something to think about is uh, the O-1 visa being uh, for persons of outstanding ability in their field. One of one of the possible fields being the arts, the fine arts could conceivably be used uh, to, uh, to approve an O visa for an NFT artist. And certainly the, uh, the NFT artists that have really made themselves known, I think would meet the criteria for the O visa. You've got to show essentially either international recognition, which is very easy to do on the internet compared to, uh, you know, if you're making sculpture and showing them in galleries in person, it's gonna be much easier to gain an international audience on the on the, the internet. And um, so I think they would meet the the O criteria. And uh, that is something that you can think of. And then as, as everybody in the probably attending knows that, you know, just as with uh, the O visa being a non-immigrant visa, you have your immigrant visa counterpart, which would be your, your EB1 for your extraordinary ability. So I don't know, maybe someone in the chat in the attendees know, or someone out there knows whether anyone successfully filed either an O visa or an EB1 uh, category I-140 for uh, somebody of extraordinary ability who ha is an NFT artist. But that is uh, one of the uh, possibilities with our current visa categories. And, um, you know, the credit card company Visa uh, launched something called the Visa Creator Program, which is uh, to support a global cohort of creators, including artists, musicians, fashion designers, and filmmakers to further advance uh, their businesses by developing non-fungible tokens. Um, so um, yeah, let us know what you th what you think about that. But that is our first category. Roman, you want to comment on this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, the only thing I would add was I think the largest. I mean, I'm actually going to look it up right now. Um, so there's an uh, there's an artist whose name is Beeple. Uh, that's his sort of on online name. But he sold an NFT for um, I think it was. 69 million dollars if i'm not mistaken uh, 20 uh 28.9 million dollars through um sotheby's so you know the, it was one of them it was like it, it was oh no it, it was 69 million dollars I, I i lied about that it was like this really kind of conglomeration of a lot of these different virtual pieces of art that he created and it's crazy to think i mean some people go and look some people look at nfts and say okay it's a jpeg i can copy and paste it 
and you know and and have it on my computer the idea behind it of course as you said james is this like ownership of it there is nfts have something hard coded into it that shows exactly who owns it and therefore even though i can have a copy of it there is proof of a master you know the original and, and that's what creates um the the price but from an 01 perspective i mean listen if you sold a piece of art for 69 million dollars um i would hope that that would be at least one of the qualifying factors i, I would think visa. so now one thing i i wasn't 100 percent sure of with the <laughs> nft if you if you have the original if somebody did copy it um is it you know are there any do you know are there any protections in place that would stop it from being copied like a regular graphic file or would it be visible or could one ascertain that one was looking at a copy versus looking at the original nft i probably depend so i don't know the answer to that 100 percent. it probably depends on how you're copying it so if you're taking a picture of a screen of, of your screen with another device it may not be trackable but perhaps if you are on a site and you do control copy maybe the, the, there's an opportunity for um that uh, uh the, the the computer to recognize that you're actually pressing a copy function and either might not allow it i mean for example if you do a screenshot on your iphone during um, you know, on, on Instagram or something that you're the user whose conversation you're screenshotting may be able to see it. So it, the, this, the app can, can find out from the phone, which is a separate device, whether or not a copy function effort is a privacy, you know, uh, measure, whether or not somebody's pressing the copy button. So I suspect that there's something like that built in here. Um, uh, but look, it, there's, there's, I mean, you know, counterfeiting exists in every industry, right? That doesn't mean that yeah. doesn't decrease the value of the true original. As long as I right. can certify that I have the true original, that's where the value comes in. And, and even even non-counterfeit, just simply reproductions, you know, which right. people are not purporting to be the original. I mean, I can have a reproduction of the Mona Lisa. It's not right. the same as the Mona Lisa. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so for the second one, I will talk about is um, P1 visas for esports athletes, basically. So for those who may not realize, you know, I grew up playing video games. To be fair, I played, uh, um, you know, more adventure games. And so there's not as much of, of a league there. But for folks who play competitive video games, and when I say competitive video games, literally means like shooting games or sports games where you actually compete against other people holding a controller. There are leagues for this now, professional gamer leagues, where people play and the winner receives a monetary compensation and, a pri and you know, like a prize or recognition. Um, there are professional sports leagues, just like the NFL, the NBA, the PGA, et cetera. Um, so there are people who are trained, who train for this. They travel around the world for competitions. Uh, they have sponsorship and advertising deals. I mean, it's like crazy to think that, you know, what I was scolded for doing is now a professional sport and there, but there are people who are really quite good at it. So there are folks who are already working on P1 visas for, excuse me, for, um, um, video game athletes, you know, electronic sports um, athletes. So that is something that you all, if that's interesting to you, can certainly think about, especially if you maybe live in a place where there, you know, I don't know, there's prominence in the video game of the video game industry, um, or for any reason you have interest in that, in that space. By the way, people who are playing professional video games professionally can be making millions a year um, as, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned you mentioned and I, I know we've talked before about the example of the uh, fellow, who, the uh, Canadian fellow who's the uh, champion of League of Legends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's that that person won two million dollars. Um, you know, there's also just teenagers. I forgot. Um, there, there are a lot of like fighter games, um, first person shooter games. And there was somebody who won who was like 16 years old. And I mean, he didn't win millions, but I think he won several hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, the parents had to be there and sort of are the guardians of that. But, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really it's really fascinating. If you think about it, it sort of democratizes sport in a way, because if this is a competitive environment, you don't have to be blessed as a six foot four, you know, coordinated hand eye coordination, you know, healthy, strong person in order to be an athlete, you can sort of if your opposable thumbs work and you're, you put in the hours, you can get really good at video games. I mean, I know that's, I'm oversimplifying it, obviously. Right. And I'm not, I don't mean to put, you know, if no offense, of course, to anybody who plays video games, but truly it, it gives such a great opportunity for so many more people around the world to, um, you know, to, to, to compete in a way with, with others. Right. And I think that's awesome. Honestly, I think it's awesome. Yep. 
to ex- and and they the fellow that we mentioned the League of Legends uh, champion did actually get a P visa so that's uh, that's kind of the exactly. the intersection there yeah that was granted um, great um, okay let's talk about the next one which is the um, E two visas for crypto investors I'll I'll take this one so the you know so the E two visa category as we all know is a treaty investor right a number of countries have uh, treaties with the United States and and nationals of those countries can. Uh, come to the United States using an E2 visa, which is to set up a business in the United States to put capital at risk and establish a business in the United States. Now, cr- crypto or cryptocurrency, right, is, uh, these are, uh, I mean, people call them currencies, they're not exactly currencies, but they are uh, tokens that are based on cryptography, based on the blockchain technology that are used as if they were money, right? And there's there used to be just Bitcoin. It started with Bitcoin some, I don't know how many years, but 20 years ago or so, it started with Bitcoin. And now there's just countless, countless cryptocurrencies. And, you know, uh, the value is what people are, are willing to pay for them. We actually happen right at this moment in history to be at a point where the crypto market's kind of crashing. Um, you know, a, couple, a lot of the coins are crashing and then the FTX exchange is crashing and so forth. But um, one of the questions is, you know, can, uh, how about an E2 visa for a cryptocurrency investor? Um, you know, there's not a specific uh, pathway uh, in immigration law uh, that really talks about either in the regulations or in the statute about, uh, you know, uh, someone um, setting up a, a business based on crypto in the United States. But um the question is, uh, how does what is the intersection? So, uh, you know, the the applicant could potentially uh, convert uh, crypto earnings into U.S. currency to fulfill the the capital investment requirements for the E2 visa, or maybe make a crypto investment in one of a, a growing list of businesses that transact in cryptocurrency in order to fulfill the same requirement. So the question is, at what point, you know, does that become a, a reality? I mean, you have to, when you're applying for the E2 visa, you have to show, you know, that, you know, where th- th- that the capital is available to make the investment, the capital is at risk, the amount of the capital is sufficient, that the scale of the business is going to be, it can't be a marginal enterprise, it has to be more than a marginal enterprise, you typically show a business plan, uh, in order that you have a specific plan to turn it into a viable enterprise, which is more than just you know earning a subsistence uh, living, but is actually a profitable enterprise. And if you think about how cryptocurrency plays into that, um, you know how do you how would you show that the capital is at risk? How would you determine the amount of the capital if the crypto value is in fact um, fluctuating day to day? Could you make the investment using cryptocurrency? Uh, could the cryptocurrency investment be in a, does it have to be in a crypto related business or could it be in a conventional business? Um, cryptocurrencies, of course, not being universally accepted either in the US or around the world, um, but perhaps you know, certain localities that are becoming much more crypto friendly, you know, Miami being one example, there's other examples, um, could you know possibly be locations where this would be easier to do than than other locations, but it's an interesting, it's a extremely interesting uh, concept. Yeah, no, uh, um, and and I, I guess to underpin all these, I'll, I'll I'll take on this sort of the last one, which is um, the concept of various types. I mean, we're not really there are different ways of handling this, but whether an H one B or even for somebody who's much more needed an EB one A or EB two and IW. Um, application for Web 3.0 developers. So, you know, if the concept of Web 3.0 will continue to uh, po- be popularized, the need for engineers to develop Web 3.0 technology is going to grow. And, you know, perhaps you can make an argument that it is of natu- national interest in order for us, in order for the US to remain sort of at the top of its game as an international technology uh, player, or if it's just somebody who has. Uh, really a, a international acclaim and is otherwise at the top of their field for an EB1. Um, I think getting engineers into the U.S. to work on this sort of technology is is a, a really possible and viable sort of visa opportunity or immigration opportunity today. Um, you know, I, I also think that <clears throat> the reality is we, even if we don't know 
where web web 3.0 is going to go you know in terms of how big investment is going to be with crypto or whether the metaverse is going to catch on and we're all going to have storefronts you know in the metaverse like 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 i sort of alluded to earlier the need to build this technology to even test it out is already here um and i think uh was it facebook or or twitter you know i'm trying to remember now who it was listed a whole bunch of job openings for web 3.0 engineers I'm trying I'm blanking now on which of the big tech firms it was and then it that somebody saw that and sort of not leaked it but sort of made it into a a, a, a talking piece in the news saying hey this company is switching gears to you know to um, build infrastructure for for web 3 so you know it, the need is there the, the demand is there. The supply of, of engineers is not necessarily there. And if there are folks in other parts of the world who have this skill, bringing them into the U.S. to work on these very specific um, products and technologies is uh, definitely a viable. Yeah, I mean, I would think all of the conventional employment-based categories uh, right. in EB, EB1, EB2, EB3 uh, are potentially applicable, right? I mean, if you just think about that, EB1, you could have uh, you could have uh, transferees, you could have multinational, sorry, multinational managers, uh, certainly if they're coming from abroad, coming from an internet-based company abroad and coming to the U.S. to work. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, for academicians, you might have a research position uh, at an institution that's doing web uh, metaverse-related research. Uh, they might uh, secure a permanent position. And then, of course, the example we talked about a few minutes ago with the extraordinary ability, you know, the top people uh, involved in the various aspects of the metaverse, whether it's engineering or some other business uh, related or scientific related uh, aspect, engineering related aspect of the metaverse could qualify for the EB1 category. Um, EB2, non-immigrant, uh, not, excuse me, EB2 national interest waiver, I meant to say, is, um, you know, I mean, if you think about um, the the infrastructure, the the internet infrastructure of the United States, and how it would need to be maintained and upgraded, and how the government would need to uh, think about regulating uh, both uh, cryptocurrency, regulating other aspects of the metaverse, uh, you can think about the NIW category potentially coming into play for people who are doing work either maybe either directly for the government or the or on issues that potentially implicate the national interest, um, infrastructure, security, and other things uh, for which uh, U.S. national interest as a whole is implicated as possibly being, you know, uh, something that could qualify for the uh, NIW category. Certainly with the PERM-based EB2, that's a very conventional category, right? And you um, would simply, you know, be filing a PERM for an engineer or a scientist uh, or potentially uh, someone involved in business for an, for a metaverse related company. Yeah, but all, all potentially viable. So yeah, definitely no, no shortage of, of choices there. And the people that are involved in this field tend to be very bright. So you've got, you've got these, you know, these more desirable categories, which don't have really long waiting times. We have a really, finally, thank you so much, Jokabed for asking a question. We have a, we have a question, everybody. Um, so uh, Joe Kabed says, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, as a former ONP officer, I'm curious to see what kind of evidence someone in the metaverse would produce. So I, I, if your question is what sort of evidence, um, let's just say for, for a P visa, what sort of evidence would be needed that that person is going to qualify as sort of an athlete? I mean, I don't I, I don't know what, you know, as an officer, you probably have some parallels potentially, but the idea of having a professional league, of having teams of, of international players, of having a pot of money, of having advertisers and, and you know, things like mm -hmm. that, I suspect those would be at least some of the aspects of a P1 visa to say, look, this person isn't just coming here to literally play video games with their friends in the basement. There is a stadium rented out. There are advertisers. There are going to be hundreds of thousands of people tuning in and watching some live, some virtually. There's a pot of money. There's a, you know, so I, I would imagine that it's somewhat similar to any other type of sports. I don't know, James, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, no, thoughts I, I think so. I think it tracks closely, you know, the requirements for conventional sports. I actually, I actually don't think that poses any real theoretical challenges mm -hmm. um, that at most there, they would have to come out. I think USCIS would probably come out with some policy 
uh, statements around some of the existing regulations. Um, and and this the, you could get these these category these visas approved now. I would think um, you know it has to do with the notoriety around the event and um, and all of that all of that transfers and tracks simply because you're play, you're playing a game which we're going to call a sport. I mean it's a game, but we're calling it a sport because of the competitive aspect of it. Um, you know uh, and the, the prize money involved. So. Um, but you're simply playing it electronically, so it's not it's not different from uh, you know an actual physical sport. Yeah, and I know that you know from an O perspective, obviously that one is always it really kind of depends on the industry. Um, I I know at least of a handful of immigration attorneys who have successfully, as far as I understand, filed um, O one visas for folks that are basically online content creators, um, and, uh, maybe uh, perhaps artists you know, musicians, et cetera, who, whose world is internet based. It's not, they're not concert cellists who are playing at Carnegie Hall. They're TikTok stars that created a, a you know, a, a musical number that's been featured in a hundred million TikTok posts. You know what I mean? And so I suspect there as well uh, for, for folks like that, I, I would hope that the evidence tracks what we consider traditional kind of oh one worthy evidence, but just in a virtual world. Uh, but it's a great question. And, and I think, you know, I wish some of this was public information. I suppose it isn't. I don't know if we can FOIA, uh, you know, an approval for an O or a P. Uh, but I suspect eventually, if not a policy update, like you said, James, at least, you know, maybe some uh, court decisions where they will address right. these. I, I would think you would get, you would you would not FOIA the approval, but you would, <laughs> you would see it in the it, when the cases were brought on appeal, if there were denials, right. then you would see it in the appeal decisions of the right. AAO, um, where people had prevailed, what the standards, the evolving standards were. And I was just wondering, um, one of the ways, and this is kind of like a fairly obvious thing, but one of the ways in which it's kind of hampered is USCIS is only taking, you know, paper evidence or conventional written word evidence. And when you're talking about the work being done in an inherently digital medium, um, and what you would you, you would provide in terms of evidence, you obviously have to provide uh, numerical evidence if you're talking about number of views or the reach of the person's online presence, then you're having to pull in a lot of statistical data about the the reach and the fame that the person has based on you know the scope of their online presence. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, it's just an interesting question to me as to whether USCIS is going to evolve in the types of evidence that it can receive um, in response to the evolution of these activities in the metaverse. Yeah, I hope they do. Um, I hope they do too. So, so, all right. So again, please keep asking questions or sharing your thoughts. That's a good one. Yeah, and, and um, I, I guess what what I want to do now this is sort of the fun part of the discussion. Not that what we we've been talking about is not fun. It's all fun. The, yeah, it's all fun. <laughs> but the idea here of like, okay, as immigration practitioners, and I mean, I gotta tell you, if I will go back into practice, if we can start being immigration attorneys in the metaverse, forget about just servicing professionals that are. Uh, working on the metaverse. Uh, but I think some of the things that we want to talk about are, you know, if we just, if we imagine, like I said earlier, you know, the importance and inherent sort of uh, the nature of web 2.0 of having an online presence as a via a website, how important that is today. If we can assume that web 3.0 and the metaverse will be just as important, what are some of the things that, you know, as an immigration practitioner, you can sort of envision or think about um, as necessary in, in such a world. So again, like I said, I did a virtual conference. It was not in a VR 3D headset type of thing. It was more like a, you know, original old school Mario or Pac-Man scenario where you kind of walk around in a virtually 2D environment with your keyboard. But, you know, if you play their games like Roblox is one ma major uh, video game um, engine or platform that has millions of users uh, where folks can go into this seemingly endless universe and kind of build structures they build houses um, they build uh you know libraries they you can you can sort of like roll blocks it's like a block you know you play with blocks effectively digitally and and believe it or not there are youtubers out there whose entire um content strategy is teaching people how to use Roblox in a way to build really beautiful structures. I mean, it's really, really fascinating. Um, Minecraft is very similar. 
uh, in the sense that you can build things. Um, that's another game. Fortnite is another massive multiplayer game where you can play with other people online. You can both build and destroy structures, but you also run around with a gun, etc. So it's very it's very video game e. But here's what are like one way that um, these these platforms have leveraged the real world is, for example, there was a massive uh, concert that took place in for, within Fortnite um, that I think had 2 million or something uh, attendees. Uh, the, 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 the artist is, is it's a, like a DJ whose name is Marshmallow. And um, people, the only way they could attend that conference, think about this, the only way they could attend that conference was to be a Fortnite user and to go <laughs> to that area of Fortnite within the video game where there's a stage set up and you could listen to the music in your headphones as you're playing the game. I mean, it was a massive concert that took place only in the digital world, which is uh, my wasn't there to me. wasn't there yeah absolutely wasn't there a, one of the a rap artists that was it was a Travis Scott who did a conference in the in one of the metaverse platforms that was it uh, in Fortnite or do you know about that uh, one? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm googling it right now. Yeah, there was. Yeah, one of them did. One of one of the rap artists did a con a, a concert in the metaverse, and I think it was Travis Scott. And I don't remember which platform, but yeah, so that was a one of that was a first of its kind event. Also, I yeah. started to I started to get a little inkling of this of, and I was never a huge gamer or anything, but I started to get an inkling of this when one of the uh, you know musicians, musical acts that I like to listen to, who is Vila, so much of her music related to gaming themes and i started to you know get a sense of of all this gaming culture sort of bleeding into the rest of society um yes by the way it is travis scott uh who, who was in within uh within Fortnite. um he did he, he did a performance uh so yeah i mean look the the reality is that the world in in all these sort of non-consequential contexts right i mean and i say music in the sense is not consequential and you know because you, nobody's life depends on that the, you know the concert happening or not and it, you know in the same way that if a visa doesn't get approved somebody or you know if a medical procedure doesn't happen the right way somebody's actual physical life is endangered so i think these sort of industries have more opportunity to play around with and kind of um really hone the future of the internet. And then we as in the individuals in the legal industry, especially immigration law can watch that and say, okay, that looks like it's stable. And that looks like it's, you know, th there's a possibility there. Let's, let's test it out. So if we imagine that there are people holding conferences and concerts and, you know, leveraging music that came from the video game world and, and turning it into music that you're listening to, you know, and sort of building the, the bridge, how, this is the fun part, how can we envision immigration lawyers also sort of partaking in this in this world. So um, I think there are a few options. It's just a few of the things that we've talked about prior to this, James. Um, one of them could be, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but you know, as a law firm, you could literally set up an office in the metaverse. Um, and, and by the way, for if, if any of you are listening and watching and they're like, I don't even know what this means, you know, I would you spend a couple of minutes just going online Googling um, you know, Roblox or Fortnite. Um, uh, just just to kind of see what these platforms are, Minecraft, and see what sort of things people are building there. And yes, it might come off as almost childish, but just imagine a world where it is not just children, you know, playing games and enjoying kind of like their free time with their friends, but professionals really uh, selling their services there. So again, one option could be quite literally building an office space um, in in uh, you know a, a platform like Minecraft or Roblox and having real estate in in the metaverse. And having individuals, if they're already spending their time in the metaverse, visit you in that office. The way you would talk to them would be through your headset, kind of just the way you do through Zoom. Um, but instead of them finding you by typing www.lawfirm.com, you know, scheduling a consultation and getting a Zoom link, they would walk their avatar into your virtual office, sit down on your virtual desk, and then perhaps a video conference would shoot up and then you would discuss your case. Um, I think this is very, very realistic. Again, there are YouTube channels teaching people how to build office spaces or office-like structures in these metaverse platforms, number one. And number two, there are kind of real estate companies, quote unquote, already buying up real estate in the metaverse. 
um, to, you know, I don't know what they're going to try to and, do there, lease it and, or whatnot. And, and like, like in the physical world, location, location, location is <laughs> right. everything. So, I mean, if you, you know, there are, there are some celebrities who have bought metaverse properties and if you want to live next door to them, well, that's going to, you know, be on the high end. So, um, uh, it's uh, yeah. So so uh, you think carefully before <laughs> before you go and buy your metaverse office. Yeah, but it is definitely something which um, could could easily come to pass. Um, but yeah, God, Roman, I hand hand it back to you. No, no, no. I it, that that is true. So I just I just wanted to look look it up quickly. There's a Forbes article from uh, yeah, March that- of this of this year that says it also says that metaverse. Um, uh, real estate is typically bought through cryptocurrencies. And so then, mm-hmm. you know, you can sort of start to look at this whole thing and say, is this a house of cards that's going to get crumble eventually? And, and maybe parts of it, for parts of it, the answer may be yes. We're talking about this FTX debacle now. Uh, but I think overall, there is some net movement forward with this sort of new digital world. Um, so yeah, anyways, think about the fact that there's real estate in you know, for p- physical real estate for your offices. Eventually, there became a web real estate, right? Once you get, no one else can buy docketwise.com. That is owned by you guys, right? And so it's the same idea of location. Um, what is that real estate that you have on the web? Well, in the future, what will that real estate be that you have in the metaverse? And how will you um, use it. So that's, I think, one interesting way to to think about immigration practice in the metaverse. Yeah, and there's some excellent documentaries, uh, you know, out there on YouTube, fully available on YouTube, both uh, on the metaverse in general and on cryptocurrency. Um, you know, there's a, a lengthy uh, documentary out there on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, uh, mm. which is really an excellent grounding. And if you if you watch. That one. By the end of the session, I'm going to try to get. Let me try see if I can find the name of that because it's so good. I mean, if you watch that, you'll really have a grounding. While well, I do- one thing, yeah. While you do that, I'll just say one yep. thing that I would Go think ahead. about is, um, you know, whether or not you you have an office, quite literally, in this sort of video game esque world. Um, you know, virtual meetings in the metaverse is already possible. I actually had a meeting with somebody. Uh, I didn't have the app, but I think he had the goggles in in the facebook meeting thing with that we had avatars and sort of the avatar moved as this person i was talking to was moving and his face was similar to you know the avatar's face was similar to his face again i didn't have the google uh, the facebook headset um to to kind of mimic my face and my facial features but i had a meeting in the in this person's like virtual office um and it was interesting i mean you know i kind of preferred zoom because even though it's two-dimensional i can see the actual human being's face um but i think that maybe that's just me being a grouchy old man now and saying i want it the way that it used to be versus you know uh, um, exploring the possibility of something like this like virtual facebook uh meeting room one cool thing that there uh, that we had in this meeting room was obviously it's not bound by sort of the walls here that i have uh, behind me, or even uh, um, like a, a, a green screen or a blackboard that you can have in a tool like Zoom, we were in a big room where he was writing notes down on a chalkboard, and I could zoom in and zoom out, and it was so much more interactive. That while I missed the experience of looking at this per human being's face, I saw the potential of you know having the 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 tools and like the the creativity of a video game style environment for work meetings. Now, to be fair, I had never met this person in real life or even on video. We'd only been connected on LinkedIn. So that's why to me, I thought, well, I wish I could see what your human face looks like. But imagine, you know, it's a coworker that you see once a week. And but when you're at home, you work in this sort of like virtual avatar environment. It's okay that you're not seeing that person's face all the time because you see them in person, you know, you see them in the flesh anyway. Um, but but then you can also but then you can utilize the benefits of being in this sort of endless creative environment um, where your avatar is. So again, I know this is very futuristic sounding, and I, I hope you all who are listening are, are are kind of thinking through what this might look like. And I, I'm curious to see if your gut reactions are this is insane, and you know we're going to lose touch with each other, or if you think wow these are endless possibilities, or I wonder if you think you know something in between. Uh, which probably is where we're all going to end up anyway, somewhere in between. I, I found the name of that documentary. And the one that I was talking about is Cryptopia, Bitcoin, Blockchains, and the Future of the Internet by Torsten Hoffman. Excellent. And we'll give you a grounding in, in a lot of these concepts. So I would I would check that out as a starting point. Nice. Cryptopia. Cool. I, I, I'm going to watch that. 
Um, let's see, where were we? Okay, so we talked about having an office. And so yeah. you have an office in the metaverse and you can do consultations, host and attend client meetings in the metaverse. And obviously we have to think about, it. I mean, there's so much that would need to be worked out um, to think about sort of, you know, the privacy concerns um, for talking to clients in the metaverse, how to keep a professional, you know, um, and just a whole, you know, range of, of, of topics, practical details that have to, you know, sort of um, be worked out. <laughs> Uh, transfer of sensitive data, keeping people's identities uh, confidential when you're interacting in the metaverse. All of those are things that are to come and will have to be, you know, uh, hashed out. Um, but also- No pun intended. Right, no pun intended, right, <laughs> exactly. And also, um, you know, attending conferences. I mean, think about how, you know, if you can't go to a conference, if our Roman talked about the, yeah. the conference that he held, which was excellent, by the way, and I was extremely impressed with the whole design of that interface room and where you held that conference. I mean, I really thought they, the people who designed that did a, a wonderful job. Um, but think Thank about you. even even beyond, and that was very sort of vi video gamey. Um, uh, but even beyond that, like in the in a in a truly VR, that wasn't really a a, a full VR um, type of mm -hmm. environment, but in a full VR type of environment. Um, where you're actually wearing, you know, a VR headset. Um, think about that, how exciting it would be to attend a conference like that, where all sorts of experiences uh, can be had. Um, and you would be able to attend on location, even if you couldn't physically go. So the conference could be, you know, in, in Fiji or something. And if we can't all get on a plane and go, we could attend virtually and really enjoy a lot of aspects of what it would be like if we were actually there live. So I think uh, conferences in the metaverse are going to be way better than doing, you know, an online, an online CLE or an online, you know, a conference that you would do nowadays. Yeah. And I would just add to that. The last thing I would say would be, you know, when you start thinking about conferences, you start then to think about networking in general. Um, and, and are there going to be networking opportunities with fellow people, you know, fellow immigration attorneys with, 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 uh, other creators, you know, your prospective clients. I mean, look, if you're going to be talking about P1 or O1, um, uh, applicants for, for metaverse or NFT or web 3.0 related kind of, you know, uh, achievements, where are you going to meet them? Right. You're going to meet them in the place where they're doing their, their thing. Uh, so going to, it's it just like how immigration attorneys who let's say work on, at, you know, work on, let's just say tech, right? You you, you handle H1Bs and, and other things for, for tech companies. You know, yes, you go to ALA conferences to learn about the law, but maybe you go to a tech conference to meet with your prospective clients, to meet with startups that may want to bring in an engineer, to meet with investors that may have a slew of companies that need immigration help, et cetera. You go to where your prospective clients are, right, in order to pitch your services. You might go to medical conferences if you work with hospitals. So same thing here. If you're going to be thinking about working with NFT artists or you're going to be working uh, with, you know, influencers, YouTubers that are building Roblox-related channels and have hundreds of thousands of followers and want or subscribers and want to come to the US, you're probably going to have to go on Roblox and interact with them somehow and say, hey, by the way, I'm a US immigration lawyer. I know you're based in Finland. If you've ever thought about coming here, I can, you know, maybe let's discuss an O1 opportunity or, or something like that. Yeah. And I, I think that's how it happens. I think you you start having those examples, those interactions, those consultations with people who are who are deeply into that technology and are comfortable with it already. And then once that becomes an accepted thing to do, then I think it starts to bleed out into society as a whole. I mean, there was a time not too distant in the past where lawyers you know, felt that they shouldn't communicate with clients by email. Oh, we can't email them. We have to mail them the letter, you know, um, but that's a joke now, right? So um, in the yeah. same way, uh, it became something that people did in certain industries and then it sort of bleeds out and gets more broader acceptance in society. Amen. Exactly. And, and and that's the thing to remember that it, it's actually nice that this these things are moving so quickly, because we can both remember when there was new technology coming around the corner that we heard people naysay. And very quickly, we've moved past that to the new thing. And now we've become the naysayers, myself included. And so I think it's actually good to to remember that we don't go have to go back into the history books to remember when people said there's no way 
that I'm going to do this via the internet. Uh, my client is going to want to talk to me on, uh, you know, in person where, and you know, now we can't wait to get the new chat bot for our immigration law firm because we realize that the initial 30% of the conversation can be done online and they actually may not want to talk to someone or, or, or what have you. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really exciting uh, to, to think about what's coming in the future, sort of how can we continue to think about innovation within the immigration space? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's so much more that we can do given with today's technology you know, around immigration that thinking about the metaverse and all that feels almost impractical. But you know what? This is us keeping a pulse on what's coming in the future Absolutely. while consistently working on what's, you know, what's here today. Right. I mean, um, you know, let's it, it took a it took a while for e-filing to uh, to become a thing. And, and, and now we're talking about metaverse. But right. you, you <laughs> have to right, you have to keep abreast of where where society is going. And these are, our, you know, we want to be a little bit visionary, right? A little bit visionary. And um and and use our imagination. So uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. We're getting to the end of the hour. We hope you've yeah. enjoyed it. Um, we appreciated um, you know, the comments. And um, you know, if you have other comments, let us know. Um, so uh, hopefully, as as this uh, technology continues to evolve, we'll we'll be back here for more more conversations. And it's it's extremely fascinating. But I want to thank uh, Roman and thank all of our attendees for, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar here at DocketWise. Thanks, James. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all.